So good morning, everyone. I would love, would like to welcome you to our session. Good morning, um, this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, I know that there are still people who are sort of in the waiting room, so they will come in um, shortly and over the course of the day. Um, but it's 9.30 and we really do want to stick to time today because we have a packed agenda. Um, so let's, let's get it on. Ms. Diane Henderson, President of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. Mr. Brian Lewis, President of the Caribbean Association of National Olympic Committees and the immediate past president of the TTOC. This is Annette Knott, the Secretary General of the TTOC and other members of the TTOC executive. Ms. Tricia Smith, President of the Canadian Olympic Committee, other distinguished representatives of Olympic committees and sporting associations in the Caribbean and around the world, our speakers who have graciously agreed to join us and to share their thoughts uh, this morning, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Advancing Women in Leadership, hosted by the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. This is the sixth year of the forum, which over the years has explored such issues as the role of women in sport and the role of women in the economy and, and their contribution in society, our contribution in society. As a speaker, a former speaker and now a moderator, I can attest to the lasting impact that these sessions have continued to have, especially on our young women, girls, and as well our men, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, regionally as well as around the world. But to tell you more about the forum, it really is my pleasure to invite at this time the president of the TTOC, Ms. Diane Henderson, to deliver remarks. Diane has devoted her life to the development of sport in Trinidad and Tobago. She has served on the boards of numerous sporting bodies and has represented this country in several sporting disciplines. Now in her 10th year at the TTOC and as president, Diane is focused on athlete welfare and the sustainability of the TTOC, as well as other Trinidad and Tobago sporting agencies to which she's affiliated. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Diane Henderson. Good morning to all. Firstly, regrets on behalf of the Honorable Minister Shamfaka Joe, who is unable to be with us this morning. Um, welcome to the sixth annual Women in Leadership Forum, as Nicole has indicated, and all protocols observed. Our time is now. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past five years, we have prepared you through several topics. We delved into core reasons and principles on why women should take a position. We explore the landscape, culture, opportunities, and challenges. We launched the future is female. Obstacles for changing the landscape, the role men play, the media advocating for women's sport, gender equality, and how change itself is painful. Leveraging inner power, being fearless and innovative all at the same time, taking risks, and resilience, dealing with mental health, being financially savvy, and what parts should be taken, even leaving legacies for others to follow through mentorship. Women opened up themselves and gave their personal testimonies following the COVID-19 pandemic. Now that I have jumped and taken up the mantle of TTOC president, the realization is that we can do this. Yes, there will be challenges, the last five months are a good example. Besides games, meetings, developing new partnerships, meeting people, it calls for adaptation daily. We will require standing on our toes and in some instances being ahead of the game. But Joshua 1, 9 states, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Proverbs 3, 5, 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will direct your path. Today, we venture into being, being in the position, being a role model, being an influencer and what that means for the guests, speakers and panelists. So sit back, listen, and enjoy. And thank you for being with us all. Thank you, Diane. 
partnership, courage, um, in, you know, collaboration and stepping in with both feet. Um, Diane has really set the tone for some of the discussions that we're going to have over the next couple hours. Um, and as she said, I really do encourage you to sit back and enjoy, but also to participate with your questions, with some of your, even your challenges to some of the, the things that you're going to hear today. This really is about discussion. It really is about engagement and participation. And at the end of the day, I think the TTOC is very committed and, 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 and very intent on taking taking some of the real value or taking the real value and, and, and ideas that will come from today and, and really applying it to, their, to its own work um, as an, uh, a sporting body, but also as a part of civil society in Trinidad and Tobago and in the wider region. So I really encourage you. Um, at this stage, I'd like to introduce Ms. Trisha Smith, who will deliver a few remarks um, coming from the Canadian Olympic Committee. Trisha grew up in Vancouver in an athletic family, and I'm sure a lot of us can attest to that, and first competed in swimming before taking up rowing at the age of 17. She's a four-time Olympian, Commonwealth Games gold medal holder, and a multiple recipient of World Championship medals. Ms. Smith has held several leadership roles with numerous sporting organizations. She is a woman of several firsts, including the first Canadian to be elected to the International Rowing Federation and the first elected to the International Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne. She currently sits on the executive committees of the Panam Pan Sports and the Association of, Olymp of National Olympic Committees. Please welcome Trisha Smith. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's really an honor for me to be here. And um, before I speak about my experience on the international front, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I got involved in sport. You've heard, you heard I grew up in Vancouver, Canada, which I think you'll know is on the Pacific Ocean in the western part of Canada. And, and as you heard, I grew up in a family of five kids. Our household was one where everybody was just welcome. If you, if you, uh, as a little kid, got up in the morning and the the curtain was closed around the sofa bed. That meant somebody was staying over. We, we always had people staying over in our house, friends or kids of friends or friends of friends. And everyone was welcome in our house. And both my parents were athletes and we kids were just active along with them. It was it was about being outside and having fun. And, you know, it, it doesn't snow often in Vancouver in the winter, but if it did, um, dad would hook up some um, some old water ski ropes to the back of the station wagon and uh, tow us around on snow skis or in the summer holidays we'd call up all the neighborhood kids would just play scrub which is sort of like a softball at the park across from the house and we all joined the swim club as kids. I think it's because we live near the ocean so I think my parents thought it was a, a good way to have all five kids survive um, plus the neighborhood kids uh, were all joining so we had a, a carpool system which is you know, getting us there. And I always tell people I, I had to quit swimming because my younger sister, who was four years younger, she was so good that I knew she was going to beat me someday soon. So I retired and I started rowing and we both ended up making the Olympics in 1976. And she won a medal in swimming at that Olympics at age 14. It took me a few more tries before I won my medal. Respect, respect was big in our household. I took it for granted as a kid because that's what I saw growing up. I saw my parents, both athletes, they were a team and they were as proud of each other as they were of us. They made, they made us feel like there was nothing we couldn't do, my brothers or my sisters. It was just the way we experienced life. It was, it was more fun when we worked together. It was better when it was better for everyone. Um, we learned don't sweat the small stuff. It takes as much energy if you're talking about the negative to just roll up your sleeves and find solutions. And if you're going to do it, do it well. And always try to leave the place better with but then when you found it, you know, in a big family, try and leave the place better than you found it. So in sport, all of these lessons, they come to life or are amplified. And we all know our sport people, it's, it has the power to bring us together like nothing else and to accomplish great things, small things that breaks down barriers and that builds confidence and skills in young people and just gives us those opportunities to leave the world a bit better. 
But we also know those opportunities should be available to all in that lesson. It's better when it's better for everyone. But I have to say, growing up, and I know a lot of us experienced this, growing up, it was rare to see images of women competing in sport or on TV or, yeah, every four years at the Olympics, for sure, you might see some women playing tennis. But, you know, I didn't see women playing playing soccer on, on television until, you know, I was in university. So... So whereas at home with a mother who was a great athlete, very much an equal in, in our household, in the outside world, that wasn't the norm. And as a result, my natural reaction was to question why and to ultimately to work for change. So I really started in leadership as an athlete leader. We would do a survey of all the national team athletes at the end of the season and provide what we thought was constructive feedback to the Federation and input for future decision making. And of course, I would include ensuring both women and men had options opportunities. Fairness has always been important to me. I think it's probably, again, from growing up in a family of five kids, I want to know why isn't that like this? I, want, I like to know the rules, especially when it seems like something might not be fair. It's also probably one of the reasons I was attracted to go to law school. I like justice, fairness. I want to understand the rules of the game, the tools to make things right if change is needed. And over the years, I've learned that it's important to know the history of, and it sounds like you, you've, you've had seminars on this, the history of, in my case, sport why things are the way they are, how the barriers were erected, the governance of a structure. That gives you the understanding either to, for example, ensure there are pathways within that structure for everyone or to advocate for changes needed to ensure those pathways. Sometimes access is limited just by the mode of invitation to access. Like, like many women, um, I don't know if I would have gotten involved in international sport leadership if I'd not been recruited. I was certainly qualified. I had 13 years as a successful international athlete. I had experience in athlete leadership, I was educated in law, and I was interested. It just hadn't crossed my mind that it was something that I could do. I think it's often typical for women. So if you're recruiting women, keep that in mind. And I know you know this. If you're women thinking about getting involved, remember, as we know in sport, it's the same in life. Sometimes in order to make progress, you have to move out of your comfort zone. And I did that, and I encourage you to do it. I think we've always known as women that the strongest form of leadership comes from engaging and taking the best from a diversity of thought and experience. It's better when it's better for everyone. Research shows that top performing companies are those that boast diversity and leadership. Developing and implementing the most successful vision for any organization, including of course, sport organizations, comes from when you have input from a diversity of experience, perspective and perspectives and skills, strength through diversity. And that's why it's so important that any kind of leadership, including sport leadership, includes that diversity. It's just best practice for good governance. So we're making progress on the athlete front. Tokyo was almost 50-50 in events and numbers for women and men in Paris will be 50-50. That comes from changes from within, but also leadership from the top. And at the International Olympic Committee, they've told sports, change or be changed. That's important, leadership from the top. But we still have a way to go in leadership in terms of women in leadership. The International Olympic Committee is pushing all parts of the sports system to improve their governance, setting a preliminary target of 30%, only 30%, doesn't seem right, but 30%. But currently only about 8% of NOC, NOCs have female presidents and only about 16% of secretary generals are, are females and 36% IOC members. The Association of Summer International Federations and other oversight bodies of the Olympic movement are doing annual surveys on governance, where women in leadership is one of the areas where bodies are graded and those results are made public. We need to target 50% and we'll get there. So congratulations to all the women here today in whatever field of endeavor who've stepped up to leadership, who are choosing to do or do so or thinking to do so. And thanks to all the men and women who are supporting them. Times are catching up to what our mothers always knew was true. It's better when it's better for everyone. And our time is now. So thank you again for having me here today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tricia. Um, and it was so it, it was heartening to hear some a lot of what you have, have shared with us. Um, I'm sure many in the many of us on the call today on this session today um, may be aware of some of these statistics that you have that, that you pointed out and um, and also the positive positioning and the positive trend that we are seeing as a member of the IOC um, since 2016. Um, those, you know, that information is is really going to be valuable in helping a lot of us 
across the region and, and globally to really understand where we are, you know, and, and where we need to be and how do we get there. Um, the point about leadership from the top, um, that collaboration, that, 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 that spirit of support, um, and how do we step into those spaces? I'm um, even connecting to what Diane would have said earlier about, um, about going boldly. And so thank you very much for sharing some of your words, um, which will take us really into, um, into our conversations today. And as I get into um, the first panel, I just want to remind everyone on the call um, that we do have a, we have a Q&A box. Please share your questions in, in the in that Q and A in in that Q and A box, so that we have an opportunity to get to some of the, the questions. The panel, um, I know that the panelists are jumping at the bit to really have that kind of conversation with everyone. So feel free to share some of your um, some of your speeches, some of your your questions as well. Um, so let's get into our first panel. Let's get straight into it. And it's interesting, this first panel really comprises women who are leaders in just about every sphere, in just about every sphere um, and in every sense of the word. Their resumes boast accomplishments in sport, banking, finance, technology, education, public policy, and, and media. I think that among the four of them, they could probably run a small country. Dr. Karian Hepburn Malcolm is the Managing Director of Guardian Media Limited, a former banking executive. Dr. Hepburn has held leadership roles at two of the countries of this country's largest and most successful banking um, financial institutions. Olympian, and now we call her coach, Cleopatra Borrell, probably needs no introduction at this forum, but Cleo, as she is fondly referred to, is a four-time Olympian, a champion of the Pan Am Games and the CAC Games, and a winner of multiple Commonwealth Games medals. She's now a coach at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Raquel Moses is the CEO of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator and a TTUC executive member. She's a change leader who very much believes in driving global critical global issues such as climate change, sustainability, and building resilience. She has served private sector corporations such as Microsoft, Cable, Cable & Wireless, Fujitsu, and JP Morgan Chase, and has also served in the public sectors as president of the, of the Investment Promotion Agency of Trinidad and Tobago, or InvestTT. And finally, when it comes to passionate advocacy for equity and level playing fields in sport, You'll find no greater proponent than Dr. Sasha Sutherland, Executive De Director of the Caribbean Regional Anti-Doping Organization, RADU. A part-time lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Dr. Sutherland also serves on the National Compliance Platform for Anti-Doping in Barbados. This former triple discipline athlete is, a is also a former lecturer in the Hague University for Applied Sciences, International Sport Management Program, and was an adjunct professor and visiting scholar in the sport management of George at George Mason University in Virginia. Ladies, good morning. Welcome. Let me kick off the conversation right away with you, Karian, and ask pointedly, I guess, um, as women, are we in fact changing the game? I do know for a fact that we are changing the game. I heard um, the speakers that came before me, including yourself, um, sharing the sentiment that diversity matters and diversity matters at the top. Um, I think for a long time, uh, women have not necessarily had a say in, um, in the public sphere or in very high offices. So if you, if you look back even a couple of decades ago, the fact that you know, women were unable to, to vote or you know, women weren't necessarily an active part of the employment force, they were at home, um, or there was a time when women, women couldn't even file for a divorce. Um, so we've come a long way to the point now where we see women being you know, heads of state, you know, presidents and prime ministers of countries, heads of corporations, chairman, ch chairwomen of, of boards, um, and um, research has shown that women bring a unique element to all those spaces that they occupy. Um, so not only are, are we made different biologically, physiologically, but also I think the way that we've been socialized and the way that we think, you know, add and inject a difference to those spaces that we have now ascended into or that we are now allowed to participate participate in. So I absolutely think that women make a difference and women make a positive difference. Thank you. 
And if I didn't say it before, my apologies, we are talking changing the game here. Um, Carrie, and thank you very much for, for, for sharing and for kind of kicking the ball off and, and opening the batting as it were. Um, but if I could um, just kind of switch modes and get, and get Raquel into the conversation. Um, as someone who has worked globally across multiple sectors, Raquel, how do you see women changing the game? Some of what Carrie has pointed to in terms of the evolution thus far. Are we, are we really leading or maybe even lagging in some of the sectors? So I think it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? We are, and thank you so much, uh, Nicole. Um, it's a double-edged sword in that we are absolutely making progress and we lead differently, as Carrie was saying. And in that, there is so much research that shows, and, and Trisha talked about it, about you know when you have more diversity at the top of an organization, you, you find that the results are better, not just in terms of the performance of the company, which is true, but you also find better, you know, better equity, better, better satisfaction, people are happier. And if we're looking at how things are progressing in terms of the quality of life, it absolutely requires that we have more women at the, at the leadership. And when Trisha was talking, I thought it was so beautiful. She was saying that, you know, even though she was qualified, even though she was talented, she had to be asked to take up this new space. And in addition to sort of hope, hoping that we're not necessarily preaching to the choir here, that we also need to, as much as we need to be willing to step into leadership roles as women, we need to encourage others who may not necessarily see themselves in that way. Because as much as I agree with Carrie Ann that we are making progress, we are making progress too slowly. Right now, the estimate is some 200 years before we get to gender equity. And we need to be, we need to be demanding of, um, I think you had provided all of the, the data, it was either you or, or the president provided the data in terms of, you know, where are we against our objectives, whether it's, you know, a goal of 30% or where are we at 16%. And we need to understand, okay, if what we want is 50%, because it's better for everyone, then we need to track that. And we need to be looking at that data all the time and see how we're performing against that data. I'll tell you, when I was 16, I expected that this would have been solved. And so now I'm like knocking on 50, you know, I'm just like, how, how have we not solved this yet? So I think we need to be far more deliberate about how we solve this issue for our boys as well as for our girls. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And I like how you, you really put that together and, and bring it back to the fact that it's the equity is not necessarily about women advancing only, but it is about everyone moving, moving correctly. And you're right. I mean, you know, I wish I could say that I'm still knocking on 50. I've knocked and opened the door and walked through. But the, the fact is that you would have expected that we would have got a lot, you know, a lot further yeah. by, by now. And you, you have to yeah. wonder. And, you know, I want to bring Cleopatra in here because um, as an athlete in an, in, in, you know, in, in an athlet, at athletic space, operating and, and really, you know, performing at the peak of your game, and now stepping into a new leadership role, what are some of the things that you have taken you know, with you, some of the lessons that you have learned, and maybe even some of the, the, the barriers that you still have to, to break? Yes, thank you, Nicole. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, it is indeed my pleasure to be here today. Uh, one thing and one central idea that we sort of have as women in this space is the invitation from men and of course i have to mention our past president mr brian lewis for really opening that door and giving us the opportunity with his future is female campaign and now our time is now is really fantastic work but i do agree we're taking much longer than um i believe necessary um however i must say coming into the space as a coach now you know there's really what you would call sort of woke coaching where our athletes are demanding that we as coaches coach them in a certain way. We're no longer allowed to yell and scream and shout, berate our athletes. Our athletes want to be treated as they should, as human beings, they want to be treated with care. They want to have positive mental health. They want to have a positive student athlete experience. And for me coming as a, in as a coach, that's just how I am as a female. That's how I am as a person. That's my leadership style. 
So now with my athletes, I'm seeing a space for us to advance as female coaches and the athletes really demanding that sort of care. But as an athlete in the field events, it's a very traditionally male space. So I'm just calling on women to take heed of what our athletes are asking for and to provide them with the service that they're now demanding. The yeah. public in general is demanding the service from female leaders and we have to step up to the call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Sasha, um, as your, you know, given your, um, your, your, your experience, um, particularly the work that you're doing in education um, and your own, your own discussions with women around the world. Um, we see enrollment numbers in, in universities, certainly in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, we are seeing that shift in the enrollment numbers. So we know that more and more women are taking up the opportunities, are going after opportunities in education. Yet, as Raquel has pointed, as even Trisha has noted in, you know, with some of the information she shared, even some, even um, what we know to be the case, we're not quite seeing those we're not quite seeing that shift into leadership spaces why do you think that is or do you have your own you know experiences that you can share on that yeah um i agree with you that more women are reaching higher levels of leadership than previously uh, but the gender disparity in leadership at the top of organizations is still alarming according to the the research statistics and as you said trisha alluded to some of the the sporting numbers when we look at the composition of the boards etc and professional leads things like multinational corporations, women are largely underrepresented and women, and they only account for about 35% when you start looking at um, the professional level in business, in academia, in the media, in policymaking organizations. And as you go higher up uh, into senior management and executive positions, then that percentage decreases. So I agree that not enough qualified women are actually taking their place in leadership positions. And I'd probably say for two reasons. Um, one, when we look at the data, we see work-life balance for women who are also caregivers whether that's for children or for the elderly, is difficult without adequate support systems. And then the cultural expectations around work and professionalism tend to create challenging environments for new moms and parents who seek to, to balance career and family life. Now, people might say, no, times have changed, etc. The data says otherwise. So what happens is when you're trying to strike that balance, um, oftentimes people choose either or, mm -hmm. and it leads to women being overlooked as future leaders within the system when they can't make long meetings or go on long trips or simply because they're women, um, they're not in a space where the real decisions are being made on the, the golf course or at the bar, you know, sometimes those decisions are made there before you get into the boardroom. And so what that does is it kind of perpetuates this, this um, gender gap in pay. It, it perpetuates this lack of professional attainment for women, the large majority of women, not all, and career satisfaction for women who, who want longevity in the workforce. So what you find might happen is that some women delay having children if it conflicts with their career aspirations or they might change professions to strike a balance. So going back to getting women into leadership positions and keeping them there, I think one of the possible solutions is to look at the system, right? And we take our a cue from the Scandinavian countries, they're welfare centered. They place greater emphasis on things like egalitarianism between both sexes, and then they make social allowances for children, you know, for both. Um, they kind of like, they include incentives for fathers to take leave, and then they provide affordable childcare for professionals. So that as a, as a woman in leadership or as a man in leadership, you're coming to work and you're able to focus on the task because a supporting system is there, not provided simply by you, yeah. but also by the environment. And I think if we attack perhaps these two considerations, we will see more women taking professional and senior management positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you for that. Um, and, and you've brought out, you know, several issues inside of there. And I want to go back to Carrie Ann um, as someone who has, you know, taken a leap, so to speak. You know, you've moved from Jamaica, you're now in Trinidad, um, taking on leadership positions 
over time, you know, in, incrementally, but also progressively. Um, have you seen some of those challenges, even based on your own experiences, your own background? Um, have you seen some of the issues that um, that, that that Sasha has has raised in terms of one um, that environment, um, you know, really in, encouraging you or supporting you, and at the same time also seeing opportunities where you can be yourself in your space. Um, thank you for that question, Nicole. Um, and to piggyback off of what Sasha has shared, I have experienced some of those challenges. Just yesterday, I was sharing with a friend who is pregnant and she was having some trepidation around, you know, telling her boss or, you know, um, she has a prospective job on the table and she's, should I tell the new employer? But if I don't tell them and they suddenly see a bump, what are they going to think? And I could literally see the trauma that she was going through in having to make a career decision and feeling like it was a trade-off between being pregnant and advancing her career. And similarly, I shared with her that uh, when I became pregnant, I had just started a new job and I had the same kind of fears. I didn't know when to tell my boss. I'm like, okay, let me wait until it's safe when I'm sure I'm really pregnant, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, when I shared it with my boss, he was understanding enough, but then I felt the pressure of needing to prove myself that, you know, the pregnancy was not an excuse for me being slow or not, you know, being as assertive and aggressive and as active as I needed to be. And I remember throughout the pregnancy traveling and, um, you know, when you go on these business trips, you fly early, you have dinner meetings in the night, and it was a lot on my body, but I almost felt like I couldn't ask for a pass. You know, I wanted to make sure I was showing up and my ankles would be swollen and I would be dead tired, but I was determined to prove that I was in the game. I was just as competent as anybody else on the trip. And similarly, even during maternity leave, I didn't have that peace of mind. I felt like I still needed to check in. I still needed to do work. I still need to make sure in a sense that I had a job and that I, I wouldn't feel so dispensable, <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of psychological um, pressure that, you know, comes to the fore when you're pregnant or when you have a child. And of course, similarly, when I had my child, uh, eight weeks after giving birth, uh, there was a big transaction that I was leading and they were flying to another country to advance a transaction. And there I was, baby eight weeks old on a plane. God bless my aunt who had flown from Jamaica to come and help and provide a support. So as you've been saying, a support system is so critical because many of the things I do, if I didn't have a good support system, there's no way I would be able to do it, you know, whether work or as Sasha mentioned, uh, the reality is a lot of decisions happen outside of the formal workspace it's in these social gatherings and it's making yourself present it's doing the strategic networking because at the end of the day we are humans we like to do business with people we trust people we like people that we feel that we know and while the the formal workspace does lend to that to some extent it's really outside of work when you're you know, you're chit-chatting, you're sharing more, more about each other, probably over drinks or, you know, that you really get to advance that um, relationship or friendship, um, you know. So I do think that it's particularly hard for women to balance those expectations and to, to do those things, given yeah. whether, yes, the world has advanced significantly, but there's still an expectation that a mother plays a certain role you know, um, or that a wife plays a certain role. And so that pressure comes to bear on us in many ways, either through comments of colleagues, friends, um, even, you know, <laughs> with your family, um, uh, there the guilt is real, you know, when you're traveling a lot or you're very busy and you feel like you're neglecting your child, but yeah, I'm doing this for my child. <laughs> you know, I want to give them a better future. This is why I'm chasing the dollar or I'm trying to advance. And so I really feel like it's, it's a constant juggling act. And personally, some days I nail it and other days I feel like I'm failing miserably in one area or the other. So yes, the struggle is real. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you, you reminded me of my own experience as a, as a young parent. Um, I remember having to, you know, pick my son up from daycare, get back into the office. I was working in, um, I was an editor at a, in a newsroom at the time, and he would be in the car seat on, you know, in his car seat as a baby on the desk right next to me while I'm 
editing stories and typing and you know with one hand kind of rocking the the car seat so he he would you know he would stay calm and it, I think that that reality and and that was several years ago I think a lot of that is still part of the experience that women particularly women who are looking to progress and advance in their careers and it shouldn't have to be a choice it you know you shouldn't have to say you know do I have a family or do I have a career it really ought not to be um Raquel if I could bring you back in as someone who's worked in 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 multinationals and recognizing just some of these issues that 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 Sasha and Cleo and Carrie Ann have raised that whole question of it you know, it made me think about as well the whole question of, of imposter syndrome and whether it is in fact a thing um, and how women, you know, how do we as women, some women deal with that? They, you know, they, they get that promotion and then they suddenly look around and wonder, hmm, I wonder if everybody thinks that I'm not ready, I'm too young, you know, I'm not young enough, I'm, I'm too experienced, I'm not experienced enough, I have too, you know, I, I have a PhD, I don't have a PhD. How do we, how do we as women, you know, deal with some of those things? You know, it's such a great question and thank you so much. When, when you talked about imposter syndrome, I'm here to tell you it is absolutely real. So um, uh, two weeks ago, I was at the UN General Assembly and I attended an event and I happened into this room and I sat down, I caught on the side of a, a seat and then someone sat, sat beside me and I was like, hey, and he said, hi. And I looked, I did a double take. It was Michael Bloomberg sitting next to me. Wow. And we're both UN, uh, UN FCCC global ambassadors. But I felt in that moment, like, oh my gosh, like I literally wanted to jump up and run. I'm like, we're both UN global ambassadors. I'm in the room because I'm supposed to be in the room. And he's a human being, just like I'm a human being. Yes, at a different level, but yeah. You know, and, and so, and I realized we need to share more of these kinds of moments with other women because you know when you see me speaking on on the highest levels all over the world doing all of these things it is at a significant sacrifice to my family there are times when i'm in my hotel room crying because i miss my daughter and and it's real but it's worth the sacrifice and i want to go back to something cleopatra said, said that really um sat with me she was talking about this work coaching and how we speak to our athletes and that's so important but how do we speak to ourselves that's the thing we need to be encouraging ourselves we need to be our biggest champions we need to quiet the noise in our heads that says that we are not worthy and we need to realize that in order to get the best out of this world we all need to participate and yes at times it will require sacrifice but it will also require that we build, as Karianne was saying, these support systems, that we require our partners to be partners. And as much as the whole system needs to change, we need to also recognize that we can control the things that we can control, which means that we need to make the choices to take up leadership when it comes to us. We need to seek out leadership as women because it is important, not just for us, but for the entire system that it will require sacrifice but the sacrifice will be less and less over time and that there are going to be times of doubts and everyone has doubts and it's okay to have doubts but it's also really important that you wake up every morning and realize that you are willing to be the best version of yourself and that you speak to yourself kindly and you encourage yourself to continue yeah that 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 self-talk is just so vital um that we you know that we really and and we are maybe we are conditioned in a little uh, in some ways to be a little tougher on ourselves you know of that course we the research shows that women are by far more tougher on ourselves we 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 you know when a man is is 50 qualified he he you know will go yes. for it when we're 130 percent qualified we're like oh i don't know <laughs> you know we have to, we have to realize that part of closing this gap will require that we are willing to step up and it's okay and we need to be willing to say you know what i'm going to go for it even if i'm not at 100 percent. don't wait till you're 130 percent. even before you're because you can grow into these spaces so true thank you so much for that um cleo and work being a walk coach how do you see um how how has um i guess being a caribbean athlete woman overachiever some may say um but how has all of those how have all of those elements contributed to your to, to your being this coach and leader and I suspect it's more than just the coaching side of it I suspect there is the mothering the 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 the, 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 the motivator the conversationalist the friend I suspect it's all of those things uh 
Well, Nicole, I, I would have to admit that my work-life balance is is not where it should be. Um, and, and I'm okay with that uh, because these are the choices that I've made um, as someone who wants to be a high achiever. I, I kind of found myself behind my, um, my generation, if you will, because I'd spent 20 years playing Olympics and um, mm-hmm. I was not in the workforce and and so entering the workforce, as Raquel mentioned, I definitely felt like an imposter. I'm like, yes, I've been an athlete, but do I know these rules that surround the NCAA system? Do I know the system? Do I know how to engage with my colleagues in a workspace? Um, you know, the skills one learns as a international shot putter does not always transfer well into the workforce. And so that was something that I definitely needed to, to learn and to, to work and grow, but I would piggyback on what Raquel just mentioned. You can, of course, grow into your positions. And as women, we need to go for it. Um, I'm surrounded by coaches and I know that um, what I know is, is, is just as much as they do and I have the experience, but still yet I am constantly studying, I'm constantly growing, constantly looking for that next certification to prove my worth to be in this space. And so as women, we have to be brave, we have to step up and we have to be willing to grow into the spaces that we deserve. Um, when we're in these spaces, I believe everyone benefits from diversity. And so we have to be willing to challenge ourselves and to go there. I, I want to read... Um a comment from one of our participants, um, Donna Rina. And Donna, thank you for this. Um, she says, I'm, t- I'm in total agreement with needing support. I'm absolutely thankful for my mom as she watched my son while I traveled. And sometimes she and my son traveled with me on my business trips. It is difficult if we want to be a mother, wife, and career woman. Career woman. We need support. Um, we need support, but can we do it? We have to want it. Um, and I think, you know, Donna, thank you so much for that. And I'd encourage others, um, if, if you have a question or a comment, please share it in the Q&A. Um, that, Sasha, that, that, that question of needing of support, um, I wanted to also bring this whole question. We're talking about changing the game. And a lot of people may say sometimes you, do ha- you have to also play the game, that the game, the rules have been defined by others, by men. And, uh, you know, in as much as we want to break barriers and, and smash through ceiling, ceilings, we still have to play that game. How do you see it? And what have you experienced and seen for yourself? So I'll, I'll bring a sport in an education perspective, I think. Yeah. I believe that like the, the environments within a lot of organizations, right, and particularly sports are constructed around male values, male expectations, male rules. So, you know, we, we look at full, um, strength and decisiveness and confidence and things like competitiveness in leaders, right? And we see those things as positive values in leadership and we oftentimes see them in men and not women. And when women bring their competitive side or their assertive side, they're not necessarily embraced, right? Mm-hmm. Women are not expected to play the game, so to speak, um, Nicole, because the game was not constructed with us in mind. So what women have decided is that the arena looks good and we want to be a part of it. Um, But we still have the imposter syndrome, as as you said. We're en route to claiming our space. I don't think we're there yet. But that's the only reason why I think that is so is because the space was not created in mind. And so our participation is prohibitive to, to our success in that space because we're going against male value systems, male measures of success. And so we don't like to talk about things like patriarchy and male hegemony and their links to the marginalization of women um, when we have to navigate largely male networks and male spaces. But if we don't dismantle the whole idea that leadership is, te- is genuinely a masculine goalpost and that goalpost is what upholds these institutions, then there'll never be a level playing field for women in leadership. You'll never be able to play the game, especially when we're dealing with things like gender pay gap and discrimination and workplace bias. So I think one of the ways that we 
quote unquote, play the game is perhaps to take cues from the persons who've gone before us. And so, you know, I was watching a documentary on Nancy Pelosi the other day and what she had to battle in politics. And then I think of what Mia Motley is doing in the Caribbean as a Caribbean leader. So I and, and they're not silenced, right? They've stepped yeah. up and they've stayed. And I think we take our cue from women like that. If you're in education, think of Malala who was shot, but she's still voicing, she's still advocating for other girls. And then in our region, that would be people like Professor Eugene Barrett, so who, who started, you know, the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the Cable campus and it grew into the school and then this, this huge program. And then if you want to talk about um, sharing our lived experiences and that of other women, she's done that at the university. Within sport, I can think of when I entered as a young athlete and administrator, there was um, Reverend Dr. Ivo Gludon, mm -hmm. there was Grace Jackson. Um, as you get into the Olympic movement, you see people like Nicole Huberts and um, Sandra Osborne in sports and even Trisha, who's, who's here with us this morning. These people have made their own pathway sometimes by accident, but they also bring other women and male allies along. I think that's also important, male partnerships. So they play, they're playing the game, but they're playing it on their own terms. And I think that's something that we need to learn to do because what it does is it, it, it destabilizes the inherently male structure and it forces us to deconstruct all these notions that we're talking about today and reconstruct what it should be look like so we're talking about the future is female but the females are here and now we're saying our time is now mm -hmm. and what does that mean for us entering these spaces so you know play the game perhaps but you have to play it on your own terms and when you don't know what that looks like there are persons who've gone before us and blazed the trail that we can yeah. take what what um, we can from it. Yeah, yeah, and I believe that you know stories are stories are incredible teachers, incredible ways of of really sharing experiences and as you point, lived experiences by other women. Um, Carrie Ann, how do we you know as we as we think about a lot of what Sasha has said and what we've all been seeing, what all of you have been seeing. Um, throughout the course of the morning, how do we explode some of the old tropes um, that are still lingering, like women are their own worst enemy, um, we don't support each other, we don't help each other, we always, you know, you, 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 you're always side-eyeing the girl next to you who's moving a little faster than you are in, in, in the workplace. How, how do we explode some of, some of those I would say, you know, I, I would say almost myth, myths because, um, you know, I, I think that we have to, you know, we really do have to challenge these notions. Um, that's a great question, Nicole. Um, so you're right. I, personally, I have found those to be myths for the most part. Yes, there are instances of, you know, a female in the organization who you might feel does not have your best interest at heart or does not support you. But I've also found that with, with males too, right? So I think um, I start by looking at each person as a human being, that's a unit, right? And, you know, people have um, motives, ambitions, and sometimes you stand in the way of that, or you're their competitor, um, or for some reason you end up being um, an adversary or somebody they feel they need to keep down and not support. So I don't look at it so much um, in terms of gender, but uh, you know how uh, I stand in relation to the person that is behaving in that way. And uh, I also ensure that I do some introspection if maybe there are things that I might be doing that's triggering that, or maybe I need to look at you know ways that I could help to build a bridge instead of further um, you know. Uh, create that divide. Um, but with that being said, I find that um, there are certain spaces or forums, it's more popular now, where women get to connect with each other. Um, and there's a mutual understanding around the challenges that we share, whether it's balancing, you know, family life and career, or for those women who are not married and don't have children, they have other challenges, you know, the kind of judgment that they have to deal with about why they're not married, they're too career focused, why they don't have children. And people make a host of assumptions about those women not knowing or, or understanding their situation, not knowing whether or not they've tried and had, you know, several miscarriages or whether or not they were in a relationship, could have been married, but were being mistreated. And so I find that those spaces where women get to connect 
we really get to take off the mask and be real and, and, and we are able to support each other. So uh, I would encourage women um, in the same way that the boys have their own club where they connect and they do what they do. I think it's healthy for women to have those safe spaces where we can share, where we can help each other, we can support each other, and where we can learn and benefit from you know, each other's experiences. Yeah, yeah, safe spaces, very important. Raquel, as, as president of the, or head of the Climate Accelerator, um, your background has been in technology, in information systems. You are now forging into a new space um, which really ought not to be considered a new space. It's about climate, um, but you know we are where we are. How, how do you see, how have you seen women leading in this space um, and, and really stepping in to give their own, you know, to, to, to really chart their own course as we have a really, you know, in, in some places, a sensitive conversation about um, what we are doing to our planet and how it's affecting That's a great, that's a great question. Thank you so much, Nicole. You know, there's, a, there's an organi organization called She Changes Climate, and it's based on a UN study that shows that when you have more women at the political leadership, you have better climate results from particular from countries. So countries where you have more gender equity in their, in their parliament or in their um, leadership across the board, they are either doing more about climate or putting in place more climate policy. And it's just, it reflects what all of the other studies say about having more diversity, right? So, but what I love about climate action is that it is an opportunity for women. And there are some calls that we're on where it talks about, you know, social changes where it's all women. And then someone were like, oh, shouldn't we have a man? I said, when, when did men start worrying about having too many women? He said, there's too many men. Let's have a thousand years of this and then we'll, then we'll get back to trying to get more gender equity in the other direction. When we have, when we have um, equal pay for women, then we'll worry about, do we have enough men in the room? But, but it is an opportunity for women. And we're seeing a lot of women in many climate spaces. We're not seeing enough women in energy, not seeing enough women in green hydrogen. We're not seeing enough women in the big money spaces where the decisions are being taken. And I wanna go back to something that Sasha was talking about where she was talking about you know, the whole construct and then the male, we're playing at somebody else's game. And I find that that's such a fantastic point. And also just to, to take a moment to commend uh, uh, past President Lewis, because you know I think tooth and nail, he fought for, for more gender equity in all spaces of sport. And I think you know sometimes to, to a great deal of, of personal sacrifice. But we need to look at who is in the room when decisions are being taken. And that's something that uh, when I was uh, head of Microsoft, Microsoft. They had this event with Michelle Obama and she was saying to the CEO of Microsoft about, you know, their gender balance and their gender equity. She says, I, I'm willing to bet I know more black women than you do. Right. True, true. And so if it is that you are trying to attract black women or trying to attract women of color, trying to attract more women in any in any configuration, you can't get a, a group of men in a room to try and figure out how to find more women. Exactly. That's just not that's not how it's going to work. And, and, to, and I love the question about uh, women and being their, their worst enemy. Absolutely, that, that is the, a distraction and a fallacy. I have had 10 times more support from women than from anyone else. And as long as society can keep us thinking that, listen, women get two slices of the pie, so fight over that. They can keep us distracted, not realizing, wait a minute, the pie needs to be 50-50 and it probably needs to be a bigger pie. Yes. And so, you know, it is the same thing. We, because women are so few, it is easier to, to pick us out and say, oh, that woman doesn't support me. But when a man doesn't support you, you don't say men don't support me. You're like, that man is a bad guy. There will be bad men and there will be bad women. But we tend to hold women to an impossible standard. And then because there are so few of us, then suddenly it is because she is a woman, not because of who she is. And so I think we need to start dismantling, as Sasha said, dismantle the system. We need to start looking at things through a very, very different lens. Who needs to be in the room? Is this actually what's happening? Is there some bigger action at play? And most importantly, what can we do? If we are admiring the problem, we are wasting time. Unless we are looking at this problem from the perspective of what can we do? What can I do? What can somebody else do? What can I encourage somebody else to do? then 
yeah. we are continuing to get wrapped up in that other game. And then, yeah, we're spinning. Um, I think that is, you know, that is fantastic. Um, I hate to do this, but we do have to wrap up. I'm already getting cues from Lovey in the background. Gentle ones. And she's a very gentle person, but I know she's going to start snarling in a little bit. Um, so let's um, let's really, um, I want to give each of you an opportunity just for, you know, really a sound bite to share what you, you know, what you most want to leave with, with our group and also encourage you, um, you know, to go into the Q&A. There's some great comments inside of there, not just from Donna, but I'm also seeing Jillian Harper and a few, and a few other people as well sharing their comments. So please go in there. Um, Sasha, let's, let me start with you. Soundbite, you know, what do you want to leave? <laughs> um, oh boy, what do I want to leave? Okay. <laughs> Um, I want to say that our time, our time is now is the, the, the theme, right? But our time has always been now. <laughs> We've always been doing it. Society is only now recognizing it and giving us center stage in some locations. So my hope is that we get to a point where we don't need to have these discussions and deconstructions a time where the future is actually us together and where our time means that we're taking the next step together I want us to just like let our light shine and then for women out there I think be prepared so that when the opportunity knocks you're ready bring other women along with you it's good to be a trailblazer but it's better if we go together and when you get to the top don't just admire your accomplishments engage in advocacy and mentorship with and for your colleagues and for those coming after you and finally don't discount the value of partnering with men to achieve these goals many of my first advocates were actually men who i'm now working alongside in sports and education to make life better for the next generation um, when i was challenged i think of people like roland butcher john or steve stout who i could go to and ask a question and more recently mr lewis brian who was always being straightforward but encouraging of the vision and that kind of mentorship I think is key. Fantastic thank you. Carrie Ann? Thank you. Um, I would say that while I think there is a collective responsibility for us to all make things better I also want to remind each and every woman that might be viewing this forum that there is still a lot that's within our own control so I would suggest for example not be afraid to reach out to somebody who you think could give you invaluable guidance, you know, or um, based on their experience. So for example, you just heard a, a host of rich information from people on this panel. Don't be afraid to message them in LinkedIn or find them. If you know somebody's story particularly resonated with you, you know, seek them out, search more. Maybe there's somebody in your organization or somebody outside of your organization that you feel can provide guidance. I know I benefited from that, from just reaching out to certain women and saying, how did you do this? How did you navigate this space? Like when I just became a general manager or um, a managing director, navigating, you know, boardroom conversations or figuring out how to deal with certain difficult situations, how to, you know, figure out the balance between home life and work life. So I'm just saying you don't have to figure it out by yourself, you know, just so find the courage to just ask somebody, reach out. And that's what I would leave. Great. Thank you so much. Cleo. Um, of course, everything that has been mentioned already by the panelists is exactly what I was going to say. So I'm going to say this to everyone in attendance here today, that it's okay. As an athlete, I was really hard on myself. And I think I'm pretty tough on myself as a coach as well. But it's okay. Where you are right now is okay. You can build from this point. And just remember, everyone does not start this journey at the same place. Mm -hmm. You are where you are, but you can get to where you want to be. And I hope that you have fun and enjoy the journey. Thank you. Raquel? Build your network, build your network, reach out to people. You know, there are advocates in every walk of life. And remember to, to build your well before you need water. So be in service to others so that when your time comes and you need someone you have people that you can reach out to and above all else read 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 learn grow 
So you're investing in yourself all of the time. And watch how you talk to yourself. Be sweet to that girl. You know she's a good girl. Thank you. I just feel as if I should take all of these comments and just print t-shirts and just have us wear them all over the place and just keep reminding ourselves of these messages. I'm so excited. I um, you know, I'm really I'm pumped, as they would say. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. Carrie Ann, Cleo, Raquel, Sasha, thanks for kicking us off. I couldn't have expected or asked. I hope that President Henderson is as, is as pumped as I am. I know she was saying she's looking forward to a great session, Trisha as well. So I'm, I hope that it, that, that it started the way that we want to. Ladies, thank you very much for, for, for starting off. Um, we're saying goodbye to this panel, but we're moving swiftly into, into the next.